Hi, everybody. Um, what a great summit this has been today. Um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're really honored to be the last panel here to, to close out this, this wonderful summit. And and the, the new cycle has been superly um, helpful for us and superly timely. So in the last uh, 48 hours, the New York Stock Exchange's owner, um, ICE, uh, has announced that it's going to invest in, in ATS uh, T0 and including installing its new CEO. And the London Stock Exchange is acquiring Tora, which is adding digital assets to its trading tools. So, so lots of development in this space and, and very timely for our panel of tokenization of everything. So my name is Brian Tang. I'm formerly a securities and IPO lawyer in the US and in Hong Kong. So it may not be surprising that ICOs found me and also not so surprising that I was not very comfortable with a lot of the structures. And so I was so, so pleased with the development of STOs and regulated tokens, which have wonderful possibilities for innovation and for democratizing of finance, although not without its risk. These days, I'm the founding ex executive director of Light Lab at Hong Kong Youth, foster law, innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And I'm, an, I'm also a board member of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. And so pleased to be invited here to moderate this all-star panel with um, each of us dialing in from four different jurisdictions. So without further ado, perhaps I can ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves, what you currently do in your organizations um, and, and your career stops that led you there and, and, and this particular panel on, on tokenization. Uh, maybe we can start with Angelina. Thank you, Brian. And uh, it has been an amazing um, day and uh, I've learned a lot. So thank you for uh, Regulation Asia, um, uh, for the crypto regulation uh, um, seminar extravaganza. Um, uh, I have, I am currently the um, senior advisor to, it's also one, one fifteen in the morning in Los Angeles. Sorry if I'm a little bit slow. So apologies for that. But uh, I, I am currently the senior advisor to the board uh, of Hashkey, uh, and I was previously the COO there, as well as um, uh, the global COO of uh, another uh, uh, Bitcoin exchange. Uh, also spent a lot of time in regulatory and traditional finance as, as a COO. And I fell down the rabbit hole in terms of uh, crypto um, by by advising a, a young startup who has now grown into a giant start a giant um, exchange. And I think this is the most exciting area uh, in in probably all of financial services right now. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, I am very, very deeply involved in tokenization, and I find it fascinating. So I'm looking forward to this panel. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Oyi, over to you. Hi, uh, Brian and uh, everyone here. Uh, great to be on this panel. Uh, it sounds super exciting as a topic. And as Brian mentioned, so many things are happening in this space. Um, that, you know, I think the evolution and the convergence between traditional finance and, well, DeFi or, or, or crypto or blockchain is happening extremely rapidly. Uh, my name is Oyi. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Adex. Uh, Adex is a private markets platform here in Singapore, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what we do. Um, I joined Adex about three years ago now, uh, well, two and a half uh, years ago. And I joined from uh, UBS. I used to run the investment banking. So, you know, a bit like Brian, come from the traditional side of banking. Um, and what was quite fascinating, I, I didn't come from the crypto angle, I actually came from the private markets angle mm -hmm. and how I saw the shift of capital from public markets to private markets and how that was already being a big part of the UBS private bank uh, shelf offerings. But, you know, it was something that was not particularly well uh, fractionalized into even the high net worth space uh, for those who are perhaps uh, between the two and 20 million. So uh, that was my entry into Adex. Uh, of course, Adex is built on blockchain uh, and distributed ledger technology. And, and you know, that is the rabbit hole into uh, crypto and, and similar to Angelina, sort of that began my, uh, my path or my <laughs> career into a different, uh, completely different uh, spectrum spectrum of uh, discussion. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much, Oi. And last but not least, Alex. Yeah, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm sitting in London, but I'm based in Zurich and I work for, I work for City Ventures. Um, my story around uh, and my career has been banking at Bank of New York uh, infrastructure at Swift <coughs> and CEO of Onchain Custodian, which is a crypto custodian service provider in Singapore. Uh, I recently relocated to, to Europe and I'm now in um, City Ventures dealing with anything that is blockchain and digital assets uh, in terms of experimentation, investment, uh, trying uh, well you know keeping an eye on what's happening every single day and every change that is happening every single day in this space of DeFi, cryptos tokenization and see uh, what does it mean for a bank like city fantastic so so I, I thought it was useful for everybody to speak to what they're doing and where they came from because it shows that really all of us are more from the traditional finance but we've now yeah. entered into this new brand new world of tokenization so maybe Angelina again, we'll come back to you. Um, so sure. you're, uh, uh, you're well known for those of us here in Hong Kong. So you know the Hong Kong scene well. Um, can you briefly describe you know, what you think of the, uh, your, your views on the Hong Kong trading, uh, virtual trading platform landscape? Right now, now you're with Hashkey and Hashkey hopes to of course, gift, differentiate itself and make it smart. And how, how does it plan to do so? So to answer your just your most recent question, Hashkey um, is hoping to be the second um, licensee uh, under the January uh, sorry, under the November sixth of twenty nineteen uh, position paper. So we were talking about that this morning. So what does that mean? Hashkey is part of the opt in, uh, which is a very um, shall we say. Uh, rigorous uh, uh, licensing regime, and basically, uh, the first firm uh, who shall remain unnamed, uh, uh, who, who has now received their first approval, uh, and our firm were, were probably the first two to actually opt in uh, to the SFC and be a part of the regulatory sandbox. And what that involves also, because it's opt in, and at that time the SFC did not have the power to give licenses we must issue a securities token if given the approval in principle. So this is an unusual um, uh, take. And there are a number of firms that have followed us uh, in that whole process. So um, I think if we can make it through this very strenuous process, we will be very, very strong in terms of being poised uh, and uh, ready to be able to take on any types of clients, and you'll see with the newest um, legislation uh, circular that went out, um, most firms will have to go through a licensed uh, firm, such as the first one that was approved, and hopefully Hashkey as the second. So, how does Hashkey want to uh, uh, differentiate itself um, from other firms? Well, number one, we're going to put in a really um, uh, quite amazing platform that will actually offer tokenization. And that's one of our key pillars is to be able to help businesses um, move into the tokenization and platform and space so that they can monetize uh, their assets and at the same time connect investors to actually form a very active market in this. Now, right now that hasn't happened in Hong Kong yet. It's in its infancy. And this is something where Hashkey really wants to get into. And we're already advising a number of corporate clients, looking at the assets that they have and seeing how can we help them bring a deal that's really interesting for the market. And has, the first deal has to be interesting um, or else it's not going to sell. And I think um, we'll touch on it today, but with the uh, exchanges moving into this space, it's going to be very, very interesting in terms of how how exchanges like ours will move into perhaps exchanges such as ICE, ICE owned exchanges and other exchanges working together. So I can see our firm collaborating and cooperating with uh, OE's firm, um, as well as working with City Ventures because City Ventures could give us the deal or give OE's exchange uh, those deals. So it's very, Let's very. Let's do a nice. deal here. Let's do a deal here, Ben. Yes. Here. <laughs> this, this, we'll, I'm a deal uh, guy, so let's do deals. Yes. Yeah. I know. 
So that's what um, I think the strategy is for Hashkey in terms of coming out with transformative um, uh, products and listings uh, for security tokens as well as utility tokens. So thanks. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Angelina. Now, or you, on the other hand, you've, you're up and running. You've got products, you know, so, so, wow. uh, and, and you've got, um, you know, a license. As well. Exactly. <laughs> license helps first. License. So in, in that particular order, right? So we'd love to hear your take, you know, in, in terms of what you know, the Singapore landscape and your role in it, um, the kind of tokenized assets you run, because again, the, from our prior discussions, I found it quite interesting. So uh, Angelina and a lot of others are coming from pure crypto side of things so so the brand new products you come from the more traditional banking side of things so it's actually democratizing existing mm. bank products to a different audience so i'd love to hear more yeah um but it, there's very interesting sort of similarities here but we did start i think in 2017 when the company was sort of being uh, developed or at least a thesis crypto was not really uh, the the best word obviously in in singapore itself but tokenization was clearly a very very powerful word um but i think the the more interesting thing was we looked at what was the problem the problem was that private market assets were not uh, you know, largely accessible, or well, it's not accessible to retail. It was certainly not accessible to even high net worth individuals, right? Mm, yeah. And, um, you know, the increasing economic or the increasing finance theory around diversification was getting louder and louder around, you know, having private markets in your portfolio. And frankly, if a private bank is uh, recommending a high net, uh, a global family office, allocate anywhere between 15 to 20% in alternatives, there surely must be a space for that in the high net worth individuals uh, portfolio. So I think that was a very interesting starting point and that sort of drives a little bit about what we do today. And when we built the platform, um, we went into the sandbox and I think it partly is MAS was very far, I suppose a couple of years ahead uh, in terms of thinking about what the tech and the licensing means. And we were very fortunate to come out as one of the first uh, fully integrated issuance uh, tokenization platform with an exchange uh, capability, right? So if you see the way we built our tech and the licensing, the ability to issue the token, to manage the token and to trade the token is uh, what's been very, very crucial to, to our business plan. And when we came out, um, as we said, we came out into COVID. So that was actually extremely difficult period, but we have then uh, developed over time the need to come back to, okay, what are we delivering to investors? And we started uh, with a little bit of the first deal was a debt token, but over time we found that funds found a place in our investors portfolio. And uh, today, fast forward, we actually have the full range of private real estate funds, um, you know, hedge funds, private equity, as well as VC funds um, across, I think, over close to about 30 transactions now. And over time, we've learned uh, to understand what our investors are looking for, uh, thematics like China tech, uh, impact, uh, you know, um, Bitcoin, uh, I mean, sorry, cryptocurrencies. We have a, a fund that's in cryptocurrency. So the, the many, many uh, ways that our investors are very excited about expressing themselves in mini market, mini private market portfolios now on our platform. So that's that's great. And so we see that uh, in our current business model, but I think MAS continues to promote tokenization. So there are a number of uh, RMO license that um, have been issued and are in the sandbox. But I do see the space, this universe is very large, right? The alternative universe is very, very large. Tokenization is going to create new asset classes, whether for example, uh, you know, carbon credits, right? That, will that become a mainstream uh, asset class? Uh, or even, you know, things like wine or cars or, or, or and all of that. So there's a little bit of experimentation in the market around a number of these ideas, which I think we can, uh, you know, speak more about about in a little bit. Awesome. Mm. Th th thanks so much. So now here, after hearing from these startups, right, uh, and, the, and, and that particular ecosystem, what are big banks like Citi uh, doing, Alex, uh, in, in kind of in reaction to the developments from a tech point of view uh, in terms of blockchain, but also from a business uh, model point of view in terms of tokenization? Uh, love to hear some insights from you. Sure. So I think CD is probably doing like any other banks uh, in, in that space is, is, is exploring still, uh, but also doing some investments and uh, some 
live, I would say, uh, product launch. Uh, going to experimenting um, first, I think it's an easier uh, area to explore as a bank because generally you're talking about uh, regulated underlying. So for example, security token, which are well understood in terms of uh, how they behave and how they should behave and how the bank should behave around uh, those those assets. So tokenizing regulated assets is obviously the first uh, obvious choice for a bank like CD and others to, 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 to explore. And that's happening for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's for internal um, efficiency uh, gains uh, around collateral management, for example. Uh, sometimes it's around uh, looking at issuance of uh, bonds that normally would be done on paper uh, and that uh, we want to do on, on uh, in a tokenized form because it makes it easier to manage, easier to uh, transfer, and easier to potentially longer term trade on a secondary market. Uh, and it's also, as I said, about investment. So on that front, uh, not CD Ventures, but our colleagues in another part of CD who are doing also investments have invested in a com company called Bondi Value in Singapore, who looks at bonds tokenization. So these are examples of uh, or testimonials of the fact that banks now, like CD, now are, are definitely looking at space and are uh, 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 getting ready, I would say, to start offering products to, to their customers without doing it yet uh, for uh, due to latency of those type of, uh, of, of organizations, but also because there are so many considerations to be taken uh, care of, uh, specifically around uh, making sure that the OCC and the Fed are, are not unhappy about what we're going to do, uh, for example. Uh, there, there are those kinds of considerations as well as a fully regulated, uh, you know, large financial institutions. Now, now, all you had, had touched upon, and as has uh, Angelina about, you know, lots of exotic potential new asset classes that folk want to tokenize or fractionalize. And this is where innovation can come in. Um, some of them are very colorful, right? Uh, some of them, you know, uh, and, and some of them have more legs than others. So maybe if, if perhaps uh, we'll start with you, or you, you know, um, can you name some of the more colorful ones that come across your desk? And then, the, and then the ones that you think are a little bit more interesting and actually have more legs and, and really have potential to be good deals. I think that was a phrase that we agreed on that ultimately needs to be a good deal, right? Yeah, um, you know, we've seen a lot. So, so mo well, all of our funds, so they are very, very traditional, you know, PEVC funds. So currently on our shelf, uh, the most exotic would be the Bitcoin, uh, the cryptocurrency fund, and we have a DeFi uh, income uh, yields fund that just launched. Uh, but that's the most exotic. But we have been actually asked to look at things like wine, um, like whiskey, um, like luxury supercars, um, and, you know, watches, for example. So these have come to us in, in various formats uh, because we do security. So, so we're kind of not doing uh, NFTs. We do things that potentially you could structure asset back notes, right? But the structuring and the tokenization and the disclosures are probably actually the most straightforward part of the uh, conversation. And, and as we talk about what is a good deal, I think we look at, um, but then the, the easier thing to identify is actually in the offline world, what already are investments. Mm -hmm. So there is, for example, people do think about wine investments, right? The wine index funds, uh, people sort of buy in a, you know, a very labeled Bordeaux and they say, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to invest in, you know, a, a whole uh, crate of that and, and see where that goes uh, and watches as well, right? So the, the, the appreciation of these items as underlying investments is already taking place to some extent. And I think what tokenization might actually do is bring that globalization and potentially, I think done in the right way, the right mm -hmm. governance. Uh, because what you don't want is, you know, you don't understand the provenance, who you're buying it from, how is it going to make money and, 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 you know, on the exit, do you get the wine or the, or the cash and what happens there? So I, I actually think that at least for these, this kind of really alternative investment types, which, or investment asset class, which already are happening offline, which is what, what I think NFT is doing for art, yep. is that there will be a, a better marketplace for it. Now, how big is that uh, asset class? That's a good question mark. How big could it be? That is, I think, the question mark. Interesting, very interesting. Angelina, what about you? I'm sure you've seen lots of, you know, fascinating structures come past your desk as well. 
the I I talked a little bit about the company that uh, some of the companies that we're advising, and uh, we've been looking at gemstones. Uh, we've been looking at property, um, uh, and on a more uh, shall we say a little bit less exciting would be uh, the area, but lucrative uh, would be the area of receivables. So how do you help a company liquid make their um, more, uh, uh, should we say, less liquid securities into something more liquid and giving the buyer of that um, uh, a good return? And for those companies that wish to actually do that, they can get stuff off their balance sheet. And for high net worth individuals, if you can get uh, a better interest rate than what you're getting from banks or lending out your crypto, then that might be interesting for uh, that to be tokenized. But since you talked about legs, uh, one of our um, uh, parent companies, subsidiaries, actually um, uh, came up with, through an internet of things, uh, a tracking uh, uh, mechanism for tracking cows. Now, since you were talking about something that had legs, uh, <laughs> sorry, oh, I didn't slip maybe on my part. <laughs> yes, um, the the Internet of Things can actually track the cow's growth, um, and for the cattle herder, um, the the vitals of the cow, how fast it's growing, uh, can actually be tracked. And therefore, the whole uh, herd of cows could actually be tokenized in terms of as an asset or as an asset class. And you can see that going forward. Um, and it's such a moving experience that... <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Ooh. Moving um, experience. There you go. Double that fun. It, it could monetize. You could you could actually use it, buy coin, tokenize each cow or a whole herd of cows or different assets. And it's not just cows, but since we're on such a moving subject, <laughs> um, uh, these assets um, and this type of thing is going to be more and more prevalent because people want to track what exactly is their commodity. Um, and uh, especially if they're live commodities. And you can see the same with fish or you can see the same with uh, 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 crops, so. Absolutely, and and I think, you know, as, as Oye had mentioned, ESG and, and carbon is, is a big trend That's right now. So carbon thing. credits, lots of carbon, I see lots of carbon credit kind of tokenization kind of projects as well and using IoT to track that. So, so yeah. again, on the innovation side, sounds great will the market buy is a different story right that's so, the question <laughs> and, and that's where you all come in now alex you had some really interesting ideas as tokenization so if one would think about innovative things to tokenize i, I think you had some interesting views too yeah well the, the cow example is some is an example i'm generally using uh in, in conferences so i've been stolen by angelina on that one uh, but it's, it's an amazing example to me because it's really allowing the, the farmer as well to to use uh, his, yeah. his, his present uh herd as collateral for a loan for example to buy new uh, cows for example or to buy uh, or, or to invest uh, in whatever he needs to do and, and i think it's quite powerful uh, when we talk about financial inclusion for example um, yeah. in, in some countries uh, other examples of course are are um, around art and i'm always um yep amazed by uh, the ability to invest in a picasso uh, and have a little portion of it uh, which does not allow me to have it in my uh, in my uh, in my room but at least uh, i have a, a potential benefit on the accrual of the, of the price of, of that picasso but uh, i think at the end of the day uh, the asset uh, which is not an exotic asset that we're all using every day it remains money and and i think tokenization of money whether it's um, uh, under a CBDC or something else is to me fascinating and in my view will revolutionize the way uh, uh, business is done. And on that front, uh, what we've been doing at City is promoting a model that is all inclusive of money, meaning that today when you look at the experimentations around by central banks around CBDCs, it's, it's very narrowly looking at central bank liabilities. It doesn't, it excludes commercial bank liabilities, it excludes uh, it excludes e-money service provider liabilities, and and those last two represents actually eighty percent of what is available to the market for for doing business. So, uh, what we've been looking at is offer is working with banks, commercial banks, and central banks, and also e-money service provider like PayPal, for example, to build a model where whereby tokenized US dollars or tokenized Singapore dollars can be issued on the same platform 
whether it's a CBDC, so a central bank liability, whether it's a commercial bank liability, or whether it's an e-money service providability, and why not stable coins in the future when they are properly regulated? Mm -hmm. So the idea is instead of creating, fragmenting something that today is not fragmented that much, which is money, uh, and uh, where uh, and fragmentations towards which we are going, if we continue tokenizing only CBDCs and then JP Morgan offering its JP Morgan coin and then uh, and every provider offering its different version of US dollar on different platforms, why don't we all sit together, regulated, like, regulated entities, and try to find a model that enables all of us to do what we do every day uh, in a tokenized form for uh, around money, but in a fungible way, meaning that uh, everything can be still as smooth as it should be uh, when it regards to money. So th that's uh, uh, an interesting uh, use case that we, we are exploring with a uh, dozen other banks uh, and central banks already have expressed an interest in that uh, because, and I'll conclude there, because I think some of the central banks working at CBDCs don't really want to start issuing CBDCs or were they afraid of doing that because it gives them um, uh, actions and jobs that they don't do today, like KYC, and they'll, uh, 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 you know, I want to answer my mother, uh, we lost our CBDC uh, on, on, on sports a call, right? So they will always need private banks to, to support them. And that model resonates with them in, in terms of how uh, all regulated entities can work together towards a uh, tokenized I, I love that to Alex, you know, CBDCs are not big enough of a project. He wants to combine them all together, right? <laughs> so, so you know, stay tuned. Next, ne next pan, next time, this time next year, we'll see how that goes. Now, so there's, now, as we've discussed, there are lots of challenges to broader acceptance of a lot of these these really innovative ideas, these, these innovative uh, new structures, these new tokens. So, what do you each think are the biggest challenge just to accept? The, uh, broader acceptance and scaling of the space and then what what actually are you doing kind of potentially to, to work towards helping address that um a lot of these are of course are, are, are industry-wide right i think as, as because really we're, we're carving a new niche maybe angelina we'll start with you sure i think one of the things that has really affected um our market and makes our life a little bit difficult is the what was happening in 2018 with the ICOs and the lack of uh, transparency, uh, the lack of follow-up um, and uh, the lack of disclosures and people that just disappeared with funds. And that really tainted the industry. Um, and now uh, one of the things or a number of things have to be done in terms of contracts have gotten a lot smarter. They can be tracked, you've got KYC now um, uh, the regulators are very much a part of this now, and it's not like you can just issue an ICO and go off and leave people hanging anymore. Things need to be uh, approved, uh, and that's keeping the SFC, for example, and MAS very, very busy uh, with that process. So that regulation factor um, actually legitimizes the entire business and actually helps it grow. The other area that's been really, really important, and I spent a lot of time doing this, is um, training about tokenization, talking about it, getting the message out there that, hey, the deal has to be good. And we talked about this when we prepped this. If the deal, if it, if, if the deal's bad, however you paint it with the lipstick and the pig, and if you dress the pig up, it's still a, a cow, pig. A cow. A cow. It's still a cow. <laughs> lipstick on a cow now. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So it, no matter how you dress it up, it has to be properly disclosed. It has to be good for the client. It has to be good for the issuer. And finding that type of thing, that is a very big challenge and making sure that the documentation is right um, and training the people that are actually buying this, um, even down to how are they gonna hold these tokens? Are they going to be in a specific wallet or so on and so forth? So that's just one factor I'm sure um, uh, Oyi and Alex have other things that they think. So just uh, start with that. Awesome, thank yeah, you. On the, on the, oh, sorry, uh, Alex, go. Now on, on your last point, as, as I always say, when you tokenize garbage, it's still garbage, right? So yep. uh, you, yep. you need to be, the underlying product is is, is key in, in everything that you do. Uh, I think the, one of the major challenge of this industry uh, is standards and stand, yeah. lack of standards Very actually, nice. and standardization. So I come from a Swift background where I was in the standards department, the, the department who deals with, uh, you know, the ISO standards that uh, are issued for the financial industry. 
at least part of them. And and the reason why uh, the, uh, finance has been one of the reasons why finance has been successful in the last thirty years or forty years and has become global is because they have started using uh, a common language, uh, yeah. which are, which are standards. So uh, ISINs to identify uh, securities. Uh, the ISO currency codes uh, to identify m money and so on and so forth. And and this is uh, this was lacking in the crypto space and the digital asset space. And uh, there have been some efforts uh, in the last uh, two to three years to uh, solve that issue, for example, around identifiers. So when you even look at crypto and Bitcoin, for example, you can find it sometimes with the ticker XBT, sometimes BTC, sometimes something else. If you look at tokens in general, uh, and only the tickers of those tokens, you have duplicates, uh, so assets that have the same ticker, the same identifier, it's a mess. So ISO came up uh, in uh, this last year, actually, with the ISO uh, 24165. You don't need to re remember the name. You just need to remember it. And the number, sorry, it's called a digital token identifier. And what it mm -hmm. gives is an identifier to the token and its technical fingerprint. So on what blockchain it resides, what is the uh, hash of the, uh, the Genesis block, if there was one, or the fork block when there was a fork, and so on and so forth. So it's applicable for, to fungible tokens. Uh, it's applicable to cryptocurrencies, but also to securities tokens, to any, any tokens, really, anything tokenized on the blockchain, as long as it's fungible, with the exception of CBDCs, because these are uh, uh, sovereign currencies that are handled by a, another standard. Uh, but uh, the idea here is really to offer trading uh, people, uh, uh, exchanges, asset managers, the ability to uniquely identify what they're dealing with, making sure they're not confusing one with the other, do proper reporting that everybody understands uh, because everybody's using the same uh, issuer, uh, the same uh, 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 identifier. I'll finish by saying that there are other working groups looking at other standards. One of them is a study group that I'm co-chairing at ISO level, which looks at should we have a, an international standards for identifying wallets, like we have the IBAN in the mm. bank. Yeah. But it's just a question at this stage because it's not an easy thing to do. So, so I think it's important to look at those things uh, at the back and hopefully that will help and contribute to the mainstream adoption uh, of this, uh, of technologies around tokenization uh, through, the, the, through standardization. Can I just jump in because it will be a massive task for the wallets to be actually tracked. And for those of us who have four or five wallets um, or trusters, how to track all of them. And I mean, it's really becoming um, a huge industry and to track every one of them, we have to definitely have the bandwidth to be able to do this. And I remember the day in 2018 or 2016 when uh, one of the founders that I worked with um, came up with that term XBT. And he was the one that actually came up with that by thinking about it and built it into the system and it became the de rigueur. But now with your standard setting, I think it's really super important um, that this is done because there's too many products out there um, and too much duplication and possibility of malfeasance. So, no, so thanks. For those for are, yeah, so for those who are interested, you can find all those standards because they're live now. Uh, on, yeah. uh, for the, the, the DTI is on DTIF.org. So that's mm -hmm. the places where people can register their token for free and where it's published for free and accessible for free. So everything is for free uh, in order to ensure that there is no uh, there's uh, no uh, barrier to entry, barrier to access. Wow. Very important work, Alex. I mean, that's great. Um, and, you know, I won't get into the battle of the standards kind of discussion, right? But, you know, yes. but, but <laughs> exactly. Right? Uh, but, but, you know, but, but it is important work uh, in terms of uh, legitimizing and, 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 and throughput of the space. Uh, anything to add along those lines there, Oi? In terms of what you're doing to help, um, you know, the big challenges and uh, initiatives perhaps that you were involved in? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think sort of a, a slightly different point here, which is quite interesting. I, I still think that we are barely at the stage where people differentiate the noise that's happening in the crypto yeah. side. I mean, the volatility of that market versus what really does blockchain uh, bring to the table? Yeah. And I think the world has really just started to recognize that. And I, well, 
some some parts of the world are starting to recognize that. And I think that needs to be a, you know, the education process and the perhaps bigger development of startups like uh, Hashkey and ourselves then drive quite a lot of that education uh, in the market to, you know, to, to say, look, you know, it's not, it's not just about the crypto, it's actually what blockchain does to evolve, what does tokenization do to capital markets, it, it actually changes the face of capital markets, what's the convergence between private markets and public markets that's going to happen because of tokenization. So this with this, that's, that's one point. Uh, and I think this will hopefully continue in the right trajectory, which is the, 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 the difference uh, that people can, can uh, appreciate. I think the second point is a bit more around uh, where I see the space is there's a struggle right now with every financial service firm, I think, in the world mm. as to whether they build, they buy, or they partner. And this is at, at the moment, I think this space is like sprouting with a lot, a lot of startups who want to do, you know, sort of similar things. The banks are trying to figure out whether they should build it on their own. You know, that there's, there's a bit, um, you know, even standardization is not really going to help that at this point. Uh, I do think this space is going to play out in a relatively messy manner yep. um, for a while. And then I think, you know, the synthesizing of who, who is doing what, is there centralization or decentralization, uh, and, and then standardization can, I think, be a big part of that. Which is I an have awesome segue. Yeah. Oh, oh, I just ahead. wanted to say, Oyi, um, you're so right in terms of there's so many different systems that are coming out. And as an ex-regulator who had to evaluate these systems when giving licenses, to what is now in Singapore called an RMO, but I used to do it for ATSs in Hong Kong. It's so difficult for the regulators and that's something that I think the industry needs to understand. And that's why going back to what Alex is saying, standardization of what are the requirements, uh, security, resiliency, uh, uh, what happens with downtime and so on and so forth, yeah. All of that needs to be put in place, and I think that's something that needs to be recognized um, going forward because it's going to kill the regulators before, <laughs> if they have to approve every single different thing. Um, so. Mm. so, so we have seven minutes left, and I mm. didn't want to leave the the panel without commentary of the big news. So the big Ooh. boy is in town now, right? So we've got ICE, right? Coming these, they they know how to do market uh, market work. They in a fully regulated manner you've got lse right coming in so these they know how to run markets right but now they're entering into this new space would you love to hear your thoughts on on on, on the uh, on these developments and how it impacts uh the the, the growth of the, the, the particular space well i think it's going to be <laughs> massive no i think it's going to be know. massive because frankly you don't need securities anymore you don't need paper shares if you ha actually issue a token, and can't you see HKEX jumping in next and doing the same thing, buying and then DD QID, which relists will be instead of having a share, they can have their tokens and they can be sent uh, either kept in a wallet within HKEX or um, to your personal uh, OE's personal wallet or Alex's personal wallet. So. When I saw that and when you wrote that, I was just like, oh, it's starting. Yep, a absolutely. Oi? Well, you know, I, I always, uh, when, when, when people ask me to describe what we do, I say that we're now the, if, if the current stock exchange um, systems and ecosystem is sort of the 40 year ago technolo technology, they're, they're like the analog, of markets and tokenization is really the digital version with the 2021 version yep. uh, of markets, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, the exchanges globally, I mean, it's not just NYC, look at NASDAQ private markets. Yep. I mean, Singapore exchange has a shareholder uh, ha shareholding in Annex because they see tokenization and distributed ledger as the way forward, right, frankly, because they have other things like market note that does bonds and, th and things like that. So I think NYSE has sort of stared at the space, must have stared at the space for a long time and see what everybody, every other exchange has either some, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, fingers into all sorts of pies. They're probably thinking, uh-oh, uh, we better get uh, some part of that going. 
Yeah, Very on exciting. that, on that I would like to, uh, like to uh, pay tribute to actually two exchanges that were the first to, to look at that, which is the ASX mm. in, in, in Australia. Yes. yes. And, and the Swiss exchange, obviously, who launched their SDX, even if it's not that as, as uh, successful as they would want to be after two or three years of work. But I mean, it, they, they, they've been uh, very active in, in understanding early that blockchain as a technology, in the case of ASX for clearing and settlement, and um, tokenization as, as, as a new way of moving assets and storing value in a way um, and on, uh, on the uh, six side, where the future. And uh, as always, when you start, uh, you, you are confronted with uh, immature technology, in, uh, things that are still moving, and it's not that easy. Uh, but yeah, everybody is following now, and, and I think it's it's great because that's for me it is the future, and and and, and um, we will see more of that in the, for sure in in the coming years. But then what you're going to see is exchanges start to mirror um, our crypto exchanges, where mm -hmm. they're going to have to move to 24 hours. They're going yeah. to have to actually um, uh, be able to span different time spans and. They're going to have to be able to have that resiliency in place and be able to trade back and forth. And I presaged this in a conference with, with Ben Quinlan. And I think everybody thought I was insane, but it, it was what three months ago and now it's happening. And uh, it's really, really good that it's happening. Yeah, and I remember well, a time I where, yeah, I remember a time where I, uh, I think, well, New York, Stock, New York Stock Exchange at one point, so uh, I think, we might see also crypto exchanges acquiring regulated. Yes. And Binance yes. just bought Forbes today mm. or bought into mm. Forbes today. Interesting. Well, I, I, all I can say is I tried to pitch the, the idea to HKEX, right? So because ASX was doing, but they were primarily using, you know, the blockchain for the back end. But now with tokenization and these new digital uh, assets, you've got new asset classes actually coming out so exactly so um so you it's not just a back-end you know efficiency uh thing it's also a front end new product side of things so um you know stay tuned uh in our last couple of minutes i just wanted to ask so if 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 there was a vast fairy godmother that can grant all of you one wish right one wish to actually grow the ecosystem what would your one wish be um alex we'll start with you uh, first this time. I don't have time to think about it. Uh, I think it would be uh, probably the, the, the wish, but unlikely to happen, unfortunately, is that all regulators finally sit around the table uh, and agree on similar, not the same, but similar frameworks, because it's so complicated to, man to maneuver. And I understand that everybody wants to keep its sovereignty and, and, and have different objectives in mind and policies in mind, and that, that's understandable. But there should be a way to to at least align on some of the basics uh, around tokenization, but also around crypto, to ensure that there is no regulatory arbitrage as it's happening today, and that the market becomes efficient. Because this is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, global market. It can't be just limited to borders anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you? Well, Alex stole my, <laughs> my uh, wish. Well, the wish. I, you know, yeah, it's not my wish, but but uh, I think the I mean just just a little bit more on top of of what Alex said is I think the clarity of the regulators around uh this, well just selfishly securities tokens I mean it's it's clear in the MAS it's not necessarily clear across the board right the digitization of securities and how that is treated I think if we had that wish to make sure that regulators are clear and and somewhat harmonized I think would be a, a the biggest way to go Fantastic. and mine is mine is the simplest wish that there's a dearth of really fabulous deals everybody makes money the investors the issuers the exchanges everybody makes money and this industry rockets and we all can retire very early so i support you there angelina <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Financial inclusion too, right? And that's innovation. Exactly. That's right. So will you, can everybody please uh, put your virtual hands together to thank this wonderful uh, panel and joining us uh, across four different countries. And now the honor goes to Nick to close out the, the Crypto Regulation Asia Summit 2022.